By, by uh, Monday, they should be up. Um, so this, this review, uh, you've seen this before. Inbreeding depression, starting with open pollinated varieties, going down to inbred parents to get heterosis. So the first question then is why would we go through this process of starting with a fairly productive variety and then inbreeding to get a very non-productive variety and then sort of undoing that inbreeding by crossing two inbred parents together to produce a hybrid. I mean, why bother? Why wouldn't you just start here and try to improve up to that type of hybrid performance? This, yes, this hybrid is very uniform, very homogeneous. Yeah. We've got some good hybrids in here, but we have no way to capture them and reproduce them generation after generation because by definition, they must be cross-pollinated in order to maintain at least this amount of vigor. So if you really wanted to maximize your hybrid vigor, and be able to reproduce that F1 hybrid year after year after year, we have to go through a problem, a process, somewhat like breeding self-pollinated pure line inbred crops so that these guys are pure line and they are reproducible year after year after year. And if you can find a way then to cross two different inbred parents year after year after year, you can always produce the same genetic complement in the hybrid. And so it sounds like a, a lot of work and expense to go through, but in point of fact, the heterosis that you can develop more than compensates for the extra work and expense of developing those inbreds and hybrids. So you say, is that really true? A lot of people are skeptical. They, they think that Hybrids are a creation of seed companies who developed hybrids in order to make money selling seed to farmers. When in essence the opposite is true, hybrids were developed in university experiment stations and farmers saw the value of the heterosis from the hybrids and actually farmers are the one who started the first seed companies to reproduce and distribute those hybrids. So what, what are the components or, or what are the things that drive F1 hybrid seed production? Well, first off, the hybrids do allow seed companies a form of intellectual property protection. Before there were any laws other than an old law that governed ornamental, uh, clonally propagated crops, before there were any patent laws affecting plants, you could produce an F1 hybrid and maintain that intellectual property through trade secrets. Only, well to begin with, the performance of the F2 seed is not as good as the F1. So there's a reason for the farmer to want F1 seed every year. The inbred parents that are needed to produce the hybrid are not publicly available. Well in the early years actually the inbred parents were publicly available inbreds, but the pedigrees of the hybrids were not available. So a seed company could pick up two public inbreds and discover that they would combine together very well to produce a lot of heterosis and they could then take those public inbreds and year after year produce what they call a proprietary hybrid. But just giving the seed company protection in order to make money off hybrids didn't make the system go. The hybrids had to satisfy all of the traits for the customers, initially farmers, subsequently downstream customers. And the price of the hybrid seed had to be low enough for the farmer to see a clear advantage in using it. And in fact, when hybrid maize started, the rule of thumb was that the first time use of hybrid seed should enable the farmer to earn an extra profit equal to at least three times the added cost of the seed. So the concept is, okay, the, the farmer will buy the hybrid seed and then he'll get three times as much yield and money 
from the crop of corn that he produces. And the farmers say, well, that's a good deal. The seed company, you know, I get 100% increase. The seed company gets 25% of that, and I get 75% of it. That works. On the other side of that corn, the price of hybrid seed must be high enough to enable the company to make profits. Well, seed companies, at least before the era of biotechnology and biotech traits, seed company profits, their profit margins were not very high. The profit margins for an apple, ad, a normal seed company were in the range of 10 to 15 percent return on equity. And if you know anything about economics of businesses, that's pretty low. In fact, in the seed business, the axiom was the margin that you get from selling each bag of seed is pretty low. If you're going to be successful as a seed company, you've got to sell large volumes of that seed. And that's why, you know, almost by design then, the more successful companies were those that sold larger and larger volumes of seed. And of course, the factors that determine the volume of seed that you sell is the competitiveness of your hybrids to meet all of those traits that the customer needs. So I talked about heterosis decline in the F2. The F2 offspring are produced by a random mating, just like in an open pollinated variety. So you get some sibbing, you get some very productive plants, but you get a lot of plants that show various degrees of inbreeding. And so the farmer recognizes quite clearly that there's enough reduction in performance of that F2 generation that economically it makes sense to buy F1 hybrid seed and plant it every year. A friend of mine in Thailand works with East West Seed. Uh, Simon uh, De Hoop has worked up a sort of a multiplier factor that he calls a quality seed multiplier where basically he takes the original cost of seed before hybrids were introduced. Well, actually, the, the cost of hybrids minus the original cost, he divides that into the total profits of hybrids minus the original profits, and he gets a quality seed multiplier, and he comes out with this is a hybrid of bitter gourd in Vietnam that the quality seed multiplier is 11. That means for every additional dollar, Vietnamese dollar, that a farmer spends on the hybrid seed, he earns an additional $11 revenue. So better than that three to one rule of thumb that started the US hybrid corn business. Here's a uh, hybrid pumpkin in Vietnam. That quality seed multiplier is 37. For every dollar that the farmer spends on hybrid seed, instead of planting the variety seed available before, he earns an additional $37 in, in uh, revenue. I think I have one more example. This is a hybrid uh, cucumber in Thailand. For every dollar the farmer spends on hybrid seed, he gets $20 back in terms of total profits from, from that hectare of land. So looking at figures like that, you can see what's happening to hybrid penetration in Asia. In the 1990s, almost no hybrids were grown. By 2000, depending on solanaceous or cucurbit crops in Southeast Asia or South Asia, 15%, 12, 40, and 10. By 2005, hybrids had expanded to 35, 25, 60 to 20, and the projections for 2010, 50, 40, 70, and 30. So if, if hybrid maize is introduced in the 30s, you said? The yeah. Maize, before that, were people planting open pollinated varieties or inbred lines or both? Open pollinated varieties exclusively. Uh, remember that one slide I showed you that from 1866 to 1930, open pollinated variety yields were pretty much flat, but that's... But that's they been selecting for inbred. They started in the 30s selecting for inbreds and hybrids. Uh, but that was only for hybrid production, no boys. No, no one has seriously proposed, well, for, to, no one sells inbreds to farmers. 
will talk uh, when I get back and talk about the private seed industry. There actually has been a, a, a seed business that has developed called Foundation Seed, where companies actually do their own private research to develop inbred lines, which they sell to other seed companies to produce and distribute hybrids. But, but those inbreds aren't grown by farmers, other than the farmers who produce and sell seed. Just threw in a few things of hybrid rice in China, and this is from a presentation that, that Dr. Yuan, who was one of the, the premier hybrid breeders. Uh, today, about 15 million hectares are planted. The average yield of hybrid rice is seven tons per hectare. The average yield of the inbred varieties that had been grown before the hybrids was 5.6 tons. It's over 20%. Dr. Yan is working now on what he calls super hybrids that are moving that yield up to 10 to 12 tons per hectare. So uh, over 60 million people can be fed every year, but that additional 20% production. This is a picture of hybrid rice in China, and uh, it, it's amazing. The, the problem with producing hybrid rice is getting the male parents to shed pollen and have that pollen spread over enough area to get good seed set on the females. So literally they use human labor to, in the production field to sort of drag ropes across the top of the field so that it shakes the male plants and moves that pollen. So very expensive to produce. Why is it a huh? Why is it a, to get, well, the, nor, the rice plant is normally self-pollinated. So normally the anthers don't come out of the flower very far. And as long as you can pollinate the styles on the same plant, you are right. In this case, they use male sterile female plants that have no pollen. So to get pollen to those plants, you have to select for males that will exert those anthers. And then you have to help that pollen move. So originally hybrid rice economically worked in China because the Chinese are not a free market system. The Chinese government says we need to be self-sufficient in rice. We will produce hybrid rice because that's the best way we can increase our yields. But now hybrid rice is beginning to take off in the Philippines, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Pakistan, Ecuador, Guinea, and the U.S. Dr. Yan concludes, hybrid rice will play a key role in ensuring food security worldwide in the new century. If 50% of the paddy rice grown today was covered by hybrids, the rice production could be increased by another 150 million tons and 400 million people could be fed. Again, the Chinese are thinking about produce enough rice to feed however many billion Chinese we have now. The, in in, uh, in China, it's, it's pretty much the same fertility regime. And in most of these self-pollinated crops that have been hybridized, it's pretty much the same regime. So that the hybrids are selected to respond to the farming systems that, that are in existence. Um, that great increase that we saw in hybrid maize the other day going up, that was due to the combination of improved genetics and improve management practices by farmers, increasing in plant increases in plant density, a little increase in uh, fertilization, but just better management. And the estimates are that about 50% of those yield increases were due to genetic gains, 50% due to management. Uh, in the rice system here, it would be less. But the gains that we saw in hybrid corn in those early years were far greater than, than uh, the increases we're seeing in rice right now. All right, so how do you develop these hybrid cultivars? You first have to develop inbred lines, but the first thing you need to learn is that <laughs> the use of an inbred line is determined by its potential to produce a hybrid when crossed to another inbred. So inbred yield of performance per se is nice, and if you've got a good performing inbred, that's great. 
but a lot of the really blockbuster hybrids the last 20 years in the U.S. have been produced on pretty poor male inbreds at least. Uh, so you cross those inbred lines onto testers, and we'll talk about testers in a few minutes, to measure combining ability, which we'll talk about again next. Test the hybrids over years and locations. Select hybrids which exhibit high levels of heterosis for the important traits. Then you have to maintain and increase the seed of the inbred line and produce the hybrid seed to distribute to growers every year. So again, it's, it's uh, a complex process, but relatively simple if you sort of take each step one at a time. So what is combining ability? It's the ability of an inbred to transmit desirable performance to hybrid progeny. And we talk about general combinability or specific. General combining ability is the contribution that an inbred will make across a series of different inbreds. So that if one inbred combines well with lots of other inbreds, it's said to have good general combinability. And actually, a lot of the genetic variance that goes into that general combinability is analogous to additive gene action. It's not quite the same, but, but in essence, you can say a lot of additive gene action or the types of things you would do to select and increase additive genetic variance works quite well for general combinability. But unfortunately, general combinability is not enough to drive that maximum performance that you get from specific combinability which is the ability of a genotype to cross with a specific other inbred genotype and produce maximum heterosis or high degree of heterosis. So the ability of genotype to combine favorably with one or a few others and this specific combinability is analogous to and in fact depends on dominant or non-additive gene action. As we talked in the mechanism of heterosis, it depends on dominant, over-dominance, and epistatic gene actions. How do you define or how do you measure these things? You can do uh, evaluate GCA by making a series of crosses. You take inbreds A, B, C, D, and E. You cross them in all combinations. A by B, A by C, A by D, A by E, B by C, B by D, you know. So you make a dial L cross. Then you grow the single cross hybrids of that dial L in a trial, and the inbred whose single cross hybrids across all other inbreds have the highest average yield has the best general combinability. So general combiners sort of the general combinability measures the ability of an inbred to combine fairly well with a whole series of inbreds. Well, practically, you can estimate that general combinability just by crossing. If you're developing a series of new inbred lines, you can top cross them onto an open pollinated variety or a double cross or a single cross hybrid, a mixture of pollen, pollen with different genetic types and actually the performance of those inbreds crossed on say a double cross hybrid is correlated fairly well with its performance across a series of other inbreds. So top crosses with a mixture of pollen give you a pretty good estimate of general combinability. Specific combinability, if we do that same dial L inbreds A, B, C, D, and E, but we don't look for the inbred that combines best across all others. We look for one specific combination. We say the hybrid A by E is the best yielding hybrid combination of that group. It's better than A by any other inbred. It's better by E by any other inbred. It's better by, than B, C, or D by anything. So we say, okay, A and E have high levels of specific combinability. And of course, nobody does dialels anymore other than a few PhD students that are trying to get publications out of their, their dissertation. Uh, nobody does dialels anymore to measure general or specific combinability. 
they use top crosses, as I mentioned in the last slide, to measure general, or they use crosses onto testers to look for a specific combinability. And so if you have population A inbred, you cross them on the testers that represent other genetic or heterotic types. The testers are based on heterotic groups. And using testers takes less time, resources than, than anything else. And in commercial breeding programs today, everything is based, well, most of the, the crosses designed to produce really superior inbred parents for new hybrids are based on specific combinability and heterotic groups. So what's a heterotic group? They're groups of genotypes which display similar combining ability, especially specific combinability when crossed with genotypes from other groups. So if a whole series of inbreds from population A combine very well specifically with inbreds from population B, then populations A and B are in different heterotic groups. Whereas if a whole series of inbreds from A don't combine very well with a series of inbreds from B, then either A and B are the same heterotic group or they're closely related. But in today's world, heterotic groups are defined by testers. And so the way inbreds are produced in the seed industry today, you cross two inbreds together, which both combine well with a third heterotic group or a different heterotic group. So that's either you cross two inbreds from the same heterotic group or you can cross two inbreds from different heterotic groups as long as you have a third group that you can use as a tester. After you make that cross, you go into the F2 generation. The S1 or the S2 generation of those new inbred plants are crossed onto a tester. And basically, those test crosses go into a yield trial. And the S1s or S2s that show the best specific combinability are advanced. The others are thrown away. So that uh, only the new inbreds that combine well with the tester are advanced. Historically, people identified some heterotic groups. And for years, we thought, OK, well, Mother Nature is kind to us maize breeders. Mother Nature has given us heterotic groups. And we know that if you get Lancaster flint materials developed in Pennsylvania, and you cross it with reed dent materials developed in Illinois or Iowa, they're different heterotic groups, and you can get good specific combinability and produce good hybrids. Well, it turns out that randomly in nature, some heterotic groups were developed, and breeders were then able to select from within those groups. But for the most part, the heterotic groups that we deal with today were created and developed and are maintained by maize breeders. And the heterotic groups are developed, how? By the utilization of testers. The heterotic groups in U.S. maize today are very, very complex and get more complex every year. But importantly, heterotic groups can be created in other crops with the proper use of testers. When I was at Cargill, I asked several of our other crop breeders to start looking for testers for heterotic or specific combinability. And in fact, our sorghum breeders first started coming up with some new levels of heterosis by finding combinations that they had never considered before. Then our hybrid wheat program found out, oh yeah, there are heterotic groups that can be identified in wheat, then our sunflower, then our cotton programs, and then our winter rapeseed programs. So you can develop heterotic groups. I said they're complex in the U.S. today. Here are some of the heterotic groups. Lancaster, which was there already, and Reed. But you know what's interesting? Missouri 17 is always listed under the Lancaster, I mean, un, yeah, under the Lancaster sure crop heterotic group. Well, actually, Clarence Grogan, who was the maize breeder here before me, developed Missouri 17 while a graduate student at the University of Missouri, 
and Missouri 17 actually came from a single cross of a Lancaster line by a Reed line. So when you start looking at it, so what do you mean it's got a Reed line in it? Yeah, in fact, WF9 is in the parentage of Missouri 17. And yet, Missouri 17 combines well with a lot of Reed types. But quite frankly, Missouri 17 didn't make a big hit in hybrids until it was combined with some of these stiff stock synthetic lines. And within these groups up here, the B14 types of stiff stocks are a slightly different heterotic composition than the B37s and the B73s. And the WF9s are a little bit different than the newer LH80s that came out. And the C103 types are different from the Ohio 43 types. These other heterotic groups were developed. Uh, the iodine group was sort of an invention of Pioneer hybrid seed. Uh, developed out of some, some really strange combination of materials, but not available publicly. So the versions that were available publicly were developed by two foundation seed companies, either legally or maybe illegally from Pioneer germplasm. And there have been several court cases about, well, yeah, not this line, but that line and some other iodine material that, that Holden's foundation seed developed. But you notice down here, here's some new inbred lines developed out of Pioneer hybrids. How is that possible? Holden breeders begin to realize, well, wait a minute, this Pioneer hybrid might be a stiff stalk by a Lancaster. Both combine well with iodine, so I can use iodine testers to pull lines out of F1 hybrids. And that really started upsetting the, the balance in the seed business in a hurry such that companies, as soon as patents, utility patents, were allowed on seed inbreds and hybrids, Pioneer led the charge to get them patented to keep people from selfing out of their hybrids to develop new inbred lines. How do they do this? Oops, oops, I went too far then, it just was slow. Uh, a lot of breeding programs will, will use this concept as sort of a heterotic triangle. and. Uh, if, if you've got Lancaster and Stiffstock were available in most public programs and they combine well with each other, but Iodent also combines well with Lancaster and it combines well with Stiffstock. So the concept is if I cross a Lancaster by a Stiffstock, I've got Iodent to use as a tester. If I cross the Lancaster by an Iodent, I've got a Stiffstock line to use as a tester. If I cross a Stiffstock by an Iodent, I've got a Lancaster line to use as a tester. And so that sort of started this sort of development so that we can cross an iodine by a stiff stock and get a Lancaster. But then we can cross that by a different stiff stock and use the Lancaster as a tester. I mean, sorry, Lancaster as a tester here to develop a new line. So that we now have inbred lines that could be complex mixtures of the original types of heterotic groups that went into them, but they're all identifiable and selected and increased on the basis that they combine well with a given tester. So just to summarize, this looks like a very, very complex process. You start with a parent population, originally open pollinated varieties, Subsequently, F2 generations of crosses between inbred lines where you have a range of performance and you have some individuals in there that perform very well. Rare desirable genotypes, but you have no way to capture that genetic composition and reproduce it year after year after year. So you start selfing to produce a population of homozygous true breeding inbred lines but most of those true breeding inbred lines don't do you any good unless they combine well with a tester to produce new hybrid combinations up in that rare elite category. And, and so it looks very complex, but once you get into this process, each year you have a new generation of inbred lines coming along 
So each year you have a new generation of F1 hybrids to test and advance and evaluate. So after about a four or five year startup period, breeding programs can start pumping out new desirable inbreds and new hybrid combinations every year. Most industry programs are a little more lenient than that. We feel if a breeder at a given research station can produce a significant commercial inbred every two or three years, they're probably worth keeping. If they can produce one a year, then they probably get paid very, very well and lots of bonuses. Those few that can produce more than one a year, can, for, for some of the systems, they used to could write their ticket because if you're really good at developing these lines, you, you really get rewarded for it. If you're not good at developing these lines, then after about five years, your boss comes and sits down with you and says, have you considered another line of work? Maybe you could go back into a university and study some plant breeding topics, or maybe you can go teach plant breeding somewhere, but you really should consider another line of work because next Friday you're off the payroll. All right? All right, so to develop these hybrids, that's sort of half the story. Once you develop them, you have to produce them. Originally, the inbreds that we got, selfed out of open pollinated varieties, were pretty poor, they were miserable. And you couldn't produce enough seed on the female inbred plants to produce the volume of seed that the farmers were demanding to plant. So actually, uh, Jones up at the Connecticut Experiment Station decided to, uh, you could do double cross hybrids to solve this. And subsequently, some population improvement using those analogous to additive genetic effects that I talked about to improve that performance per se allowed the developments of better and better inbreds. So that our, our hybrid maze started with double cross hybrids. We took inbred A by B, neither of which could produce enough seed to sell commercially. So we got the single cross hybrid AB, which was pretty productive. And then we crossed inbred C by D and got a fairly productive single cross. Then that double cross hybrid ABCD, in some cases, didn't have quite the heterosis of the single crosses. But that double cross was a lot better than F2 generations of those single crosses because that double cross was still subject to controlled pollination. And ultimately, we found that, well, all the males got to do is get to enough, tall enough and mature at the right time and shed enough pollen to pollinate all the female silks. So very early, the system went to three-way hybrids a single cross hybrid on the female side with just an inbred hybrid on the male. And subsequently, it went to what we call modified three ways. Not a true single cross here, but two sister lines. A B14 stiff stock by a B37 stiff stock to get enough vigor to produce seed in the, the female seed in the production field crossed by a different inbred. And in fact, ironically today, because of lots of reasons with some problems with disease and some problems with genetic diversity and some other problems, a, a lot of uh, single cross hybrids today are really modified single crosses. It's just there's nothing in the legal structure that says you have to, to label it, whether it's a modified or a, or a true single cross. So ultimately, we got to true single crosses. And in fact, inbreds like B14 and B37 and B73, very productive as inbred plants and can be used quite readily in single cross hybrid production. Yeah, somewhat similar. But in fact, those double cross hybrids are not nearly as uniform as those F1 single cross hybrids. Because I mean, it's essentially like an F2, right? So wouldn't it be extremely It's not like an F2, because an F2 would be open pollinated between these two that are very related, and you get a lot of selfs or sibs. 
So this is an F1 pollinated with a different F1 that even brings in some combinability. So, so more vigorous than an F2, but not as vigorous or productive as maybe either F1. But it's a good compromise if you can't get enough seed of your F1 to sell, then the farmer would, you know, there, there, there are two things that can really kill you in a hybrid seed business. If you produce a really, really good hybrid and the farmer likes it and you don't have enough seed to sell the next year, that can kill you because the farmers get very, very competitive and very irate and they'll tell you, I've been your customer for five years. If you can't get me seed of that, forget it. You guys will never set another hybrid on my farm. The only thing worse than producing not enough seed of a hybrid when you bruise too much <laughs> and your hybrid performance goes down and the farmer says, I don't want to buy that. That's a dog. I got, you got a new hybrid I want to buy. And either way, you can't win because in one instance, you lose a lot of money that you could have made if you had enough seed to sell. The other instance, you're stuck with a lot of seed that cost you a lot of money to produce and, you know, you basically could send it home with your employees to feed their cows maybe, but you basically find some way to write it off and eat it. And, and interestingly, that's what's going to probably slow the rapid development of hybrid maize companies in Africa today. I mean, there are a lot of, of farmer groups that are getting together to develop and produce and distribute hybrid maize. They haven't yet learned the difficulties of inventory management. And inventory management will kill you. Either You can't be off either direction. And it's not as easy as it seems. We'll talk about producing these hybrids. Let's go down to, well, when you produce these hybrids, you know, if you're going to sell the hybrid, uh, you got a hot new inbred combination you want to sell, well, okay, next year you've got to increase the seed of both inbred parents so that the following year you can produce enough hybrid seed to sell the third year. And, and so you're always trying to work three years in advance which of these inbreds do I increase to produce enough seed of which hybrids to sell the third year? And boy, your hybrid may be doing really fantastic the year you start increasing that inbred seed, but three years from now, the hybrids may not come, you know, something else may be there that's better. And, and so it's gotten to the point where we've, we measure the half-life of a hybrid in the U.S. seed corn industry today is about four or five years. And it takes you three years to rev up to even release it. So you're, you're looking at changes that, that are moving so fast and so rapidly that inventory management is, is a problem. Luckily for conditions in Africa, we're not quite, we're not anywhere near that level of competition. So that uh, lack of seed in one year is, is uh, a problem. But if the farmer can't get any better seed anyway, you know, it's not like there are 14 other companies that can sell them better seed. You're saved. Uh, and the level of performance isn't quite high enough and the competition isn't great enough yet that you really worry about somebody knocking your hybrid out of the farmer's field before you get enough seed produced to supply them. All right, so how do we produce these hybrids across different crops? You can do hand emasculation and pollination. That's used often in research programs to generate a little bit of hybrid seed for source populations. It's not used very often because it's expensive in commercial production. You can do this in corn because in corn you can mechanically detassel relatively inexpensively. You can do it in crops like cucumber and tomato. Why? It's just as, yeah, very expensive to do this, but the price of cucumber and tomato seed is much higher than the price of corn seed. You know, you sell corn in 80,000 kernel lots for $150 a bag. You sell cucumbers in 50 kernel packets for $12 or $14 a bag. 
you start doing the math, and 80,000 cucumber seeds going to cost you a lot of money. You can use self-incompatibility. Of course, you have to use bud pollinations to maintain the inbreds, because if they're self-incompatible, how are you going to maintain the things? Um, it is used in some of the brassica vegetables. You can use gameticides, which we didn't talk about in fertility regulating mechanism. These are chemicals that basically kill pollen or stop pollen development on female plants. These have been investigated quite a bit in wheat and some other crops, but they really never work. Uh, it, it's a problem. You have to have the male and the female parent develop at the same stage, flowering at the same stage, and you have to apply the chemical to the female at just the right time. You have to make sure that the environment, particularly rain, doesn't mess up your system. So too many variables to control. Genetic male sterility, we talked about that. But remember that one slide where you keep getting, you only can maintain the genetic male sterols by crossing them with a heterozygote. So 50% of your female plants are going to be fertile. Cytoplasmic male ster sterility is what's used mainly. I mentioned in maize we can do detasseling. I didn't have this earlier, but this is basically a mechanical detasseler. I know it's a dark slide, but basically you set those little pullers right at the top where the tassels are, and they're just little wheels that roll together like little tires, and they roll through the field and they grab the tassels and just yank them out. Male sterility, again, you have to have a cytoplasmic sterile line, and then you have to have a normal cytoplasm fertile line to maintain it. You can increase the seed of that inbred line, cross it with a line that's got a restorogene, and you can get a fertile hybrid. Uh, to do that, you plant the male sterile, a series of four or five rows, four to six rows. The male, usually two to four rows. The female, the male, the female, the male. The males pollinate the females, then you go through and cut the males out before they produce any seed. Then all the pollen, all the, the seed on the female plants comes from pollen from the males because these guys have no pollen. And so you can produce a pure field of F1 single cross hybrid seed. Here's some examples in sunflower. You see the male, the female. In uh, maize, the female, the male. And in cucumber, and I can't, from here I can't see, the female and the male. Always more rows of the female than the male. Why? You need the seed off the female, so that's what the yield you're harvesting. All you need is pollen from the male, and usually plants produce a lot more, you know, a lot more pollen is produced than you need. So basically you try to limit the amount of male plants in there because they're not producing any seed. And still in hybrid production, bushels per hectare or pounds of seed per, per hectare. Oops. So production, maintain pure line stocks, maintain male and female inbreds to synchronize, or plant them to synchronize the maturity, eliminate pollen shed from the female plants using male sterility, and cut out the male plants before harvesting to keep from getting any male seed mixed with your deal. So a summary for hybrid breeding. The varieties are crosses of two inbreds. Large-scale production requires a mechanism. It involves three steps. Develop inbreds, evaluate, test cross, and select hybrids, increase, and distribute. And the replanting of hybrid seed doesn't do the farmer much good. Any questions about hybrids? We'll talk about a lot of these concepts again when I get back to first and we talk about public versus private breeding programs because private breeding programs really were sort of fostered by the development of hybrids.